Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to introduce our speakers today and welcome you to the third webinar in our series on US-China COVID crisis. I'm Mary Gallagher. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Michigan, where I also direct the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. And I'm very pleased to moderate. I want to also represent our uh, partners in this venture, the Michigan China Innovation Center in Detroit and the National Committee on US-China Relations in New York. So today we have a terrific panel that will focus on the political implications of COVID-19 for China and on the US-China relationship. We're so pleased to be joined by two renowned experts in Chinese politics and US-China relations in order of the way that they will be speaking this afternoon. We have Jessica Chen Weiss, an associate professor of government at Cornell University. She's also one of the editors of the amazing blog at Washington Post, the Monkey Cage blog. And she's a non-resident senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We also have Ryan Haas, who is a fellow and the Michael H. Armacost Chair in the uh, Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. He holds a joint appointment also in the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Um, so now we will turn to our speakers and the first speaker is Jessica Chen Weiss. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks everybody for joining us and thanks to the National Committee for having me as well. So what I want to briefly speak to today is how the pandemic will reshape China's domestic and international standing and what consequences, if any, uh, will this uh, increase in campaign rhetoric in the United States have on the U.S.-China relationship. So starting with how things are looking in China, uh, it's really been a, quite a dramatic shift from uh, critique uh, domestically of the Chinese government's initial delays um, in um, responding to the coronavirus outbreak, including silencing local doctors who tried to inform their colleagues of the new virus. Um, and you even saw uh, calls on Chinese social media for Xi Jinping to step down. But fast forward a few weeks and, and China was uh, quite successful around the country and including in Wuhan in curbing the spread of the, the virus and, and ultimately in building domestic confidence um, and, in, in, and in fact giving a, a lot of heart to uh, Chinese nationalists and uh, propagandists who have um, gone uh, overdrive, uh, I would say, uh, in touting their success. And uh, so in the, in the wake of China's sort of triumphalism, um, I think there's been a real swelling of, of public support uh, for the Chinese government's response, especially as other countries around the world uh, have struggled um, despite um, you know, having more lead time. And so you have the Chinese media now celebrating and not only the efforts of their frontline medical workers and the so-called people's war on the virus, but also uh, the superiority of China's efforts to combat the virus, as well as foreign uh, gratitude and admiration for China's so-called anti-epidemic model. And so, uh, you know, against this backdrop of uh, sort of surging, uh, redoubled Chinese nationalism and pride, um, at least amongst some, of course, the, those who have been critical of the Chinese government have been uh, silenced or, or quieted. Um, you know, you have uh, an atmosphere in which I think it's it's quite dangerous or, or at least counterproductive for international uh, observers, let alone officials, to uh, declare their hopes that the coronavirus will bring an end to the Chinese Communist Party, including, uh, you know, even if that may be, you know, symbolic and desires and rather than actual measures uh, to subvert uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So I study Chinese nationalism um, and xenophobia. Uh, these outside efforts to um, so-called interfere in, in China's internal politics, I think, are more likely to backfire by increasing Chinese hostility uh, rather than bringing about a friendlier regime. Now, the same nationalism and xenophobia inside China, I think, also uh, place real constraints on China's international appeal. I think many around the world are concerned about what, who will step up and show global leadership in this crisis and whether this will be the moment at which 
uh, you know, the United States fades and that you know, China is ascendant, I think it's that's, um, that's certainly premature. I, I think that China is not doing a very good job of its uh, international propaganda, which is itself quite heavy handed and also um, you know, has indulged just as uh, officials in the United States have in unsubstantiated uh, conspiracy theories. Um, so, you know, China's so-called, uh, you know, uh, wolf diplomacy uh, is not uh, winning a lot of hearts and minds around the world, although, of course, there are many who uh, remain uh, dependent or grateful uh, for Chinese-provided medical supplies, uh, masks, uh, ventilators, etc., including uh, right here in the United States. So I think there are real pragmatic reasons for other countries to continue to work with China and, um, you know, keep some of that skepticism at bay. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't think this is a, a time, of, you know, the United, Chinese government has certainly not covered itself in glory in this period. Um, and, and domestically, uh, you know, there have been a number of uh, kind of, you know, outbursts of, um, of xenophobia and, and discrimination against uh, foreigners, particularly Africans in Guangzhou, that have uh, really undercut Chinese uh, efforts to emphasize their kind of magnanimity. Um, in um, containing the virus. Now, how will this all play out? Um, you know, I, it sounds like everybody thinks it's going to get a lot worse. For me, it's harder to see how it can get a whole lot worse, but I suppose right now we're still at the level of a lot of rhetoric and sort of the actual policies could get a lot worse. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm right there with you and very, very concerned about the uh, you know, I've been one out there saying that this is not a, does not need to be, is not fated to be a new Cold War, but I'm afraid that policies and rhetoric in both countries are pushing us closer to that reality. Um, so it, I think it's something that's definitely avoidable, um, but, but right now uh, there seems to be a growing spiral of mutual recrimination um, and almost fatalism about that possibility. Um, and throughout this, uh, you know, crisis we've seen, and I think um, Ryan will speak more to this, uh, again, some sort of whip sawing in terms of the rhetoric with uh, uh, some say there was a detente and kind of mutual finger pointing, but even that may already um, be crumbling uh, with over the weekend, uh, President Trump telling reporters that there should be consequences uh, if China was responsible for their outbreak and uh, evidence that the uh, many campaign strategists, particularly on the Republican side, see going after China and coronavirus as the way to, to shore up their electoral fortunes in um, November. Uh, you know, and, and, I, and I mentioned at the outset that also there have been some ads run on the other side, on the, on the Democratic side as well, um, accusing Trump for being uh, too soft on China. Um, you know, in my mind, um, these attacks are, you know, whether they will affect the election outcome or not, um, they are potentially quite uh, costly um, for two reasons. One, um, they may aggravate what we've already seen as this upsurge in, uh, you know, anti-Asian hate crimes and assaults as, uh, with the outbreak of the coronavirus. Um, but they also uh, could make it really difficult to, on a very pragmatic basis, um, gain you know, needed medical equipment from China, um, restart the economy, um, you know, both in terms of selling to China and bringing Chinese products here. So um, I think this is, um, you, know, we're, you know, quite risky uh, a tactic, um, even though political strategists may see in it um, very few downsides. Um, similar, I think that the efforts to hold China um, responsible or accountable for the coronavirus legal, via legal means are also uh, politically uh, risky and uh, legally fraught. Um, I just recently uh, reached out to a number of legal experts um, who weighed in on you know, what are the risks and possibilities that this might bear fruit, these efforts to, to sue China might bear fruit, particularly by amending the Foreign Sovereignty um, Sovereign Immunities Act. Um, and the sort of consensus was that this was quite uh, risky. There's almost no chance that China uh, will uh, participate uh, in these legal proceedings, or if they do, uh, they will work to have them dismissed. Um, it would be very difficult uh, to use these effectively to get any kind of reparations from uh, Beijing. And, but on the other hand, it's, it's quite likely that China will uh, undertake its own uh, legal or other countermeasures 
um, should these uh, lawsuits uh, proceed. Indeed, already uh, Chinese lawyers are filed lawsuits against the U.S. government um, for, you know, whether it's for, you know, Trump's use of the phrase Chinese virus uh, or uh, other, um, you know, failure to uh, effectively uh, deal with the coronavirus as it spread throughout the United States. So that's where I'll stop. I look forward to hearing um, your questions and, of course, what my co-panelist Ryan has to say. Thank you. Uh, I think Jessica has done her typically masterful job of uh, laying out uh, the dynamics at work. I will try to be efficient in my remarks and also slightly provocative in hopes that we can uh, spark a, a useful conversation with you all. I plan to spend about four minutes talking about where we are in the U.S.-China relationship and then a minute or two on the politics around China, uh, sort of building upon some of the points that uh, Jessica was making. But let me just say at the outset, I sit inside the Beltway. Uh, I, sh I will share a perspective from where I sit, but I'm most interested in hearing your thoughts, particularly from where you sit uh, across the country. On U.S.-China relations, my view is that the relationship is arguably at its lowest point that it has been at since 1979, when the United States and China established diplomatic relations, if not before. Uh, areas of cooperation are shrinking, areas of competition are intensifying, and both sides have demonstrated diminishing capacity for managing the problems uh, that are very real and that exist in the relationship. And it's, I think, reasonable to point out that there also have been downturns at previous points in the relationship. Uh, for example, in 1989, after the Tiananmen incident, in 1995-96, around the Taiwan uh, uh, Strait crisis in 1999, when the United States uh, bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, and also in 2001, when uh, U.S. and Chinese planes collided uh, near Hainan Island. But I think that this moment is different than all of those previous downturns, and I'll offer two reasons why. The first is that this downturn is not event-driven. There is no precipitating action that have caused us to move into the, the downward spiral that we are stuck in. Uh, it's rather, I think, an accumulation of stresses in the relationship that have not been dealt with particularly well. And areas of tension have been building up for some time without resolution. Um, and at the same time, areas of cooperation in the relationship have shrunk. So if you think about the relationship like a seesaw, uh, whereas previously there was a rough balance between cooperative and competitive elements of the relationship, the seesaw has crashed into the competitive side uh, of, of the ledger. And the relationship as a result is moving increasingly in a rivalrous direction. Uh, second, unlike previous periods in the relationship, when crises emerged, both countries found ways to work together. Now they are not. Um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis has demonstrated that even a global pandemic that threatens citizens in both countries is not enough uh, to trigger both countries to set down their sticks and work together for the safety of both of their citizens. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, I think that leaves us at a point of departure from where the relationship has traveled over the past several decades. Uh, during that period, there were many ups and downs, um, but it, the relationship generally traveled along a jagged upward trajectory in terms of levels of investment, trade, scientific collaboration, people-to-people -people exchanges, diplomatic engagement, cooperation on shared challenges like climate change, uh, Ebola, the global financial crisis, uh, counter-piracy, Darfur. Um, my point is not to glorify the past decades of the relationship, which were messy and tense and complex and full of many imperfections, but rather to try to make the point that I think the relationship may now be heading into uncharted territory. And so what does that look like? Uh, I am going to share with you four potential pathways that the relationship may head down uh, in hopes that, that this uh, you know, provokes your, your reactions and, and your feedback. The first potential pathway is the pathway of extreme decoupling of the United States and Chinese eco economies that sort of travels alongside an intense process of deglobalization. The second pathway is a pathway of selective decoupling 
and rising adversarial antagonism between the United States and China. The third pathway is partial decoupling, coinciding with sustained competition and the preservation of some limited capacity for both countries to cooperate when it serves their interest to do so. And the fourth pathway would be something akin to the United States and China coming together to push forward global integration, including through reform of international institutions like the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, et cetera. So in this current moment that we find ourselves in, I think the first and the fourth paths can be set aside. I think that there's a very low probability that uh, the United States and China will travel down those two paths. So what we're left with are sort of the middle paths, the second and the third path. Uh, the second scenario of, of selective decoupling and rising adversarial antagonism is basically a perpetuation of the trajectory that we find ourselves on, carried forward into a second Trump administration. And I think in this scenario, there would be very little interest in either direction in uh, appearing to be the ardent suitor in pursuing a constructive relationship with the other. I think nationalism would become more pronounced in both countries. And there would probably be rising levels of, of mutual hostility uh, and certainly um, skepticism uh, about the intentions of the other. In the third scenario, the scenario of partial decoupling alongside sustained competition and preservation of capacity for limited cooperation, I think that's basically um, you know, a shorthand way of talking about what uh, a Biden administration's uh, approach to China may look like. Uh, I think economic decoupling would probably proceed, but much more selectively and without the zeal and uh, enthusiasm of, of the current administration. There probably would be uh, some degree of resumption of two-way investment flows. Uh, I think the relationship would remain tense, but there would still be limited space for the two countries to come together when it served their interest to do so, whether on climate change or pandemic preparedness and response, uh, a global economic recovery, et cetera. So that sort of brings us to the politics uh, of China. And as Jessica was just pointing out, there has been a rhetorical escalation in recent weeks on China inside the United States. Uh, the Trump administration and the Trump campaign have signaled their interest in making China an important feature of the campaign in the coming months and uh, including by trying to label Joe Biden as a Beijing Biden. And the Biden campaign has returned fire, uh, accusing President Trump of being soft uh, in his relationship with President Xi, passive in defense of American values, et cetera. Um, for practical purposes, my sense is that the Trump administration finds itself deprived of a strong economy and facing strong economic headwinds. Uh, it also faces criticism for its handling and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think these features are going to persist uh, into the future. And as a result, I think that President Trump and, and his surrogates will see value politically in focusing public frustrations on China and trying to associate Joe Biden with China and, and with those frustrations. Uh, I do not think that, that Joe Biden will see ground to President Trump on China. Uh, so there is a strong likelihood of an escalation of rhetoric on China during the campaign. But I also think that President or Vice President Biden will want to frame the election uh, around issues like health, the economy, the role of the government in managing the crisis, uh, and make the election more of a referendum on President Trump than a referendum on each person's dealings with China. Uh, either way, uh, I think the net effect will be that there will be increasingly harsh rhetoric on China in the coming months, and that that will put downward pressure on the overall relationship, at least through November, if not longer. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for these great comments.